Do it, Kathy Atori. Oh, progress. Recording is in progress. The progression is here. Friday has been achieved. Good morning. Whoa, Marjorie, that's a nice hat you have on today. I'm liking it. Thank you. Hello, LEP. Hot day one day. Hello. Hot day. Hot Friday. No oh, I heard day. my mother. Yeah. You did. Oh, I hear LED. Yes. Oh. <laughs> so efficient. All right. All right. Okay, everyone, are we ready? Apologies for the slight delay. Yeah, technical adjustments, as Kathy said. It was the atmospheric river. I'm, ha I'm just happy that Peter Gorse is here. <laughs> Sally, how's your hand? What? All right. Okay, it's good. healing. Good. Yeah. Good. It's, I'm, I'm at like, I can move it and it has to breathe. So that's nice. Oh, no. oh good. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. I'm just, okay. Yes. I see. I, all right, we still we we still have a lot of people coming in, but we're running a little a little late, and it's such an uh, an exciting Friday with this bonus trunk show studio tour with Porfirio. All right, I'll let him in. You start right. the music. Okay. All Here right. We go. You, oh, first of all, uh, can you guys mute yourselves, please? We want to hear we want to hear this song in full. Okay. Glory. In all its glory. Well, it's the end of the week. No weapon will now its feet. Nope. 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 I'm going to stop it. It's not going right, Kathy. Just a moment. Yep. You know That's what? not glory. That's not glorious. You know what? It's 40 seconds and I got to take a little puff. So why don't you go ahead and play it? Great. Now you're vaping. All right. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Let's go back in time. Let's try this again. I refuse to not have this song be in its glory with the full sound. Here we are. And here we go. My mom's laughing. I can see her face. Well, it's the end of the week. No way. It's Feedback Friday, so come on in. Do the dance troupe. Come sit down and stare at your screen. we got to present it that you never seen. We're Feedback Friday. We're on the loose. We'll be the train. You be the caboose. It's Feedback Friday with Kathy and Amy. Mashed potatoes and the gravy. It's Feedback Friday all day long. Feedback, feedback, feedback Friday. <laughs> what a beautiful song. So Thank beautiful. you, everyone. I forgot to cue all of our uh, auxiliary um multimedia people the dance troupe and the chorus it doesn't like, matter look at their faces they're all, all did fine <laughs> they were liking our dance moves well hello 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 welcome to Fe botanical colors where the heck are we <laughs> feedback friday it is episode 76 that's amazing yeah uh so for those of you who are new uh feedback friday is our weekly show where we welcome dyers, artists, weavers, historians, scholars, uh, activists, all sorts of amazing people who are part of the color and culture and our, our favorite topic, which is natural dyeing and color. I am Kathy Hottori, president of Botanical Colors, and joining me in the red shirt is Amy Dufo on Cape Cod with hurricane level winds. Uh, me, I've got the atmosphere <laughs> quite river here. But it's windy. kind of wild. So um, welcome, and we're really pleased to have you with with you have you with us today. 
Uh, this week on Feedback Friday, we are welcoming Zapotec textile artist, natural dyer, researcher, educator, and excellent good friend and brother, Porfirio Gutierrez. Porfirio is noted for his deeply traditional weaving and natural dye techniques from the Teotitlan del Valle, Oaxaca region. He's, collab he's collaborated with the Museum of the American Indian, uh, at the Smithsonian, and his work is in the permanent collection of both the Bowers and the Smithsonian Museum. This time, Porfirio will not only talk about his education and artistic work, now, but he's now based out of his studio in Ventura, and he'll be giving us a tour. We'll also be having, this is a good part, we're also going to be having a post-presentation live trunk show, so you'll be able to both see practically touch these amazing, beautifully dyed and expertly woven pieces, and then buy them. That'll be really fun. Before we start, I just want to send out a huge thank you. You guys have been amazing in the 76 plus episodes that we've been, um, I guess we're producing this show. <laughs> we don't even think about it that way. But yeah, that all these Feedback Fridays, you guys have shown up, you have participated. It's been really lovely having you. We couldn't do it without you. And I want to thank you very, very much. Kathy, um, yes, ma'am. Did you want to tell everybody that we're that Netflix is picking us up and that we're going to be a new series on Netflix? Oh, yeah, we are. It's a comedy show. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought it was, I thought it was Hulu. <laughs> yeah, no? Hulu and Disney are picking oh, right. us up. Yeah, yeah, we're part of the Marvel um, universe. <laughs> Anyway, that's it. That's my cultural uh, like <laughs> knowledge of the moment. That's it. Um, okay, just for a little housekeeping, other than the fact that we're going to soon be um, mega stars, uh, Amy's going to be moderating and monitoring uh, the chat on this call, which is where you're going to post the questions that you have for, for Porfirio after his presentation. So right now, chat is uh, shut off, but we will open it up at the end of um Porfirio's talk, and then you guys can ask questions, and then we're going to seg into the uh, trunk show, which will be a little bit, uh, run a little bit after the normal one hour time. Everyone's going to be muted for the presentation, and then we'll open it up after questions and to holler and yell and say hello to everybody. Call is being recorded, and there'll be a, a video recording available for you after afterwards. So now I'm just going to welcome Porfirio. We are so excited to have you. Uh, join us. Thank you so much. Muy buenos días a todos. Muchísimas gracias por acompañarme. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so very much for being here, for joining me. I deeply appreciate Kathy Katori, Amy, for not only supporting my work, but to be part of my family and uh, to, to walk along with me in this beautiful journey. Today, I am going to share a little bit about um, not only the cultural aspect, um, but also um, how this cultural tradition has been interact with much more uh, urban America. I am going to talk about a little bit more conceptual um, processes of my, um, my work, a couple of series of my new work that I have been developing in comparison to the functional work that many of you might, might know, for those of you that know, have been following my work. And of course, talk a little bit about the, um, the future projects and future things that I have been working on, including farming and so forth. So um, again, my name is Porfirio Gutierrez. I, am, uh, I was born and raised in Teotitlan del Valle in Oaxaca, Mexico. Oaxaca is uh, this part of the Americas, um, about 200, uh, 200 uh, so uh, miles <clears throat> from southeast of Mexico City, <clears throat> we are in a region called the Central Valley. <clears throat> I feel extremely blessed to be born within these, uh, such a rich tradition, even though it is part of a syncretism that I grew up with, all the tradition and belief that the Spanish brought to us and how it's been shaping for the last 500 years. So much of these new ways of being have been incorporated, including the Catholicism 
as well as the understanding and the worldview of the Zapotec people from the ancestral beliefs. We dance for uh, the greater being and commitment uh, to our community. We wait on our loved ones to be, come and visit us on Dia de los Muertos. We offer them food, incense. We talk to them just like you would for any guests that you're receiving a loved ones. So we bless the food. We um, understand uh, how nature plays uh, such an important role in our culture. Uh, the ceremony communities that depicts how the red colors has continued to be used today in our community. I was born and raised in a family of musicians, of masters, teachers, practitioners of ceremony of feather dancing, of course, farmers, weavers, and uh, med medicine pra practice. So the people you see on the screen, it's my father who is a weaver. He's the one that taught me how to weave and um, how to farm, <clears throat> as well as uh, my mother, which is a spinner and a medicine practitioner. She has tremendous knowledge of traditional medicine. So I grew up around the understanding of plant as medicine, not so much as a color, because by the time I was growing up, natural diet tradition was already extinct. My parents continue to use few of the plants, but so much of it was already gone, especially the use of indigo and cochineal insect. I grew up with the understanding that nature is alive just like us and that we refer to the rain as divine being. We believe that water is alive. So much of the practices and, and, and healing process that my mother does, it happens through, through the river especially in the foothills of the mountains because uh, the rivers are the rivers bring in the forts of nature and that we understand that water is alive just like us my mother would always say that the greater being bless her hands to do the work that she does and not because she chooses to do the work instead the greater being choose her and bless her hands to do the healing through the plants and medicine uh, as medicine Growing up around this such a rich culture, and as we say in Espanol, it's the carga cultural, right? This such a heavy uh, cultural identity has obviously has, it's the base of, of what I do today and my understanding of my work and a contemporary artist has obviously influenced tremendously my work. And, and to me, that is one of the most important things that I had that I have to, to offer as far as my work. Again, I started to weave when I was 12 years old, uh, officially. Uh, throughout my life, my childhood, I was a shepherd, farming and just helping different aspects to create one piece, uh, cleaning uh, or winding the bobbins, cleaning the finished pieces. But at age uh, 18, I think where my journey started uh, as an enrichment of migrating into the United States and, uh, and, and between this diaspora of migration, I found such a deep uh, calling for the work that I do today, but also I found an enrichment to be a, in a different environment as much more urban America. I am Porfirio Gutierrez. I am Zapotec from Teotitlan del Valle in Oaxaca, Mexico. My loom came from uh, the village in Teotitlan, my community, that's a family that so dedicates their, their lives to make looms. This is a tapestry weaving technique. This is what I grew up with. This is the same technique my father and my grandparents used. My ancestors, however, use a backstrap denture loop. I was 12 years old when I formally learned how to weave. By the time I was growing up, 
the natural diet tradition was already lost. So I didn't know anybody. I didn't see, I was not aware of anybody in the village that was still using natural diet. And with my ancestors, they were obviously art existed. It was blankets, it was a garment for us to wear. Then when, when the tourism arrived in Oaxaca, they became to be known as rugs. Mass tourism and wholesalers has been demanding much more cheaper and faster. So that managed to deplete the ancestral knowledge of natural diet. Seeing and being aware of this, this situation, I really wanted to bring this knowledge to my work. I wanted to create something that it's truly meaningful and that it could be guided by my ancestors through my parents and revitalize this natural diet tradition and create a, an expression within the world with this complexity, but also enrichment of being part of these two countries. I present my work as an art form because I also want the art world, specifically the contemporary art world, to find out what to do with me. I want them to start asking themselves, what are we going to do with these guys? I am indigenous of the Americas and I'm not defined by a border. I am defined by the values of my ancestors that it is that comes from nature, that comes from the land. The majority of the plants that I use in Oaxaca, they grow here, so I harvest here where I live in California. I immediately noticed that this is a plant that it's high on tannin, that it could be uh, a great source for browns. When you understand that you are an extension of nature and when you understand that nature, it facilitates the possibility of life in this earth. Uh, it, it's to, to understand, to only take what you need from nature. I don't only think about the color. I think about the source of the color. That what I'm working with, it is a living thing. It is something that's alive. These are insects that breed some prickly pear cactus. And when I think about the process of farming them to uh, turn into a pigment to make red, I think what I am doing right at this moment has a lineage or has a link to thousands and thousands of years of wisdom and knowledge that has been developed but at the same time it's connection to nature itself you start to see the incredible red the tradition it grows and it's alive through us and that's how it evolves it's preserved and it's how it innovates with the people, no matter where they are. <clears throat> so I think to myself, and I meditate about this, what is um, tradition? if tradition has been evolved for, for all these uh, thousands of years and that um, how, in, how immigration plays an important role on um, the movement of people, uh, how uh, even a reference to uh, the uh, monarch butterfly, the need of people to be able to move and relocate um, here in the United States, it is absolutely rare for you to live in a house for 50 years of your life. You're constantly moving. In Mexico, 
in communities like mine, that's not common. But we are we know that human being has always had the need um, to to move across the, the globe. And when I think about migration in this context, I really start to meditate about uh, these subjects uh, because the notion uh, um, that tradition stays on the other side of the border. Uh, our, uh, we see that, uh, or we think that traditions get, cannot live elsewhere other than uh, its origin place. And I really start to uh, uh, think about that because um, the tradition flows through, through the people. It has nothing to do with border. And specifically when we're talking about the Americas as a whole, the tradition um, evolves, it's preserved and innovates through experiences, but through the people. Here in Southern California, there's over 200,000, over 200,000 Zapotec indigenous that lives here. Not to mention overall indigenous Zapotec like Misteco and Triqui. So um, I did a post uh, a while back that I was talking about this particular plant that uses medicine, but also uh, for olive green, it's called Yashi. And it grows wildly around here in Ventura. And uh, the plant it gave me the opportunity to think deeply about how the plant might have gotten here. And um, when maybe the plant started to, to grow here, it could have been also indigenous here to this area. But in Oaxaca, that's exactly what we use for bathing. Um, I specifically approach that as a healing process when you're bathing, but also for, uh, for, for yellow. I'm sorry, for olive green. So I re it, re it, gives me, it gave me an opportunity to start to think about that uh, the border has really nothing to do with the indigenous people of the Americas. When I think about this, I myself, I'm not even Mexican. And falsely, we obviously call this country America, but the America is a is continent, continent, the whole continent, right? So let's just refer to it as the America. I'm not even an American myself or United States, you know. I am indigenous of the Americas as a Zapotec nation. And my work is driven by the land. And a great example of it is this plant and the many plants that grows here that I use and also grows in Oaxaca. That is the guidance and there's a reminder of them. I'm still the land of, of our ancestors and that my work, it's also possible here. So we think because of the border, we think of two countries. But when I think of it in this context, I think about it of one land where indigenous people of the Americas have been living thousands and thousands of years. So this is more than just to be able to meditate about this, but it is an opportunity to celebrate all of us who now call this land home. The work that you see here um, on the screen, it is a body of work that I started to develop during the pandemic that's called Continuous Line. This is a practice that start to engage traditional knowledge or ancestral knowledge into contemporary art world. Meaning this work has, is approached by not just aesthetic designing, nor the materials. Instead, it is looked into conceptual understanding of, of the work itself. It has really nothing to do anymore with a rug, with uh, maybe just direct symbolism on one particular element on the, on, the, on the design. Instead, it has this conceptual approach that engages the, art, uh, the contemporary art world, um, that it is something that maybe it's not seen very commonly in artesanía or um, artisan practice, especially when we're speaking about Mexico. So this is this body of work that um, talks about this continuous line. I, I really start thinking about continuous line by looking into limitations. Limits, uh, just the word limit, it says it all. 
And as an immigrant, the first thing I encounter is the border. I, we, I came all the way to Oaxaca and stamped myself on the border. I could not go any further. I really started to think about that before my ancestors, they were able to interact thousands of years ago, but not anymore. So that was my first limitation. And once I was able to cross the border, my second limitation was language. And you could go on and on. That has given me an opportunity to start thinking about these continuous line. These opportunity to think beyond limitation and to start thinking about the richness of this country, the richness of the community like we all see here. 220 uh, incredible souls that has taken the time to come and join this talk. It's to celebrate that, it's to come and reach each other, it's to learn the language, to learn to be part of the society here in this country and continue the line of continue reshaping, reinterpreting, of being as indigenous, but in specifically the work itself. So this is one of the pieces that I, uh, it's part of this series. It is made with, uh, for those of you that are weaver, uh, with 22 warp thread per inch, pomegranate background with noes and sapote. This is another work that, um, that it's embroidered. Um, it has texture on it, and the texture was adding on the loom. It is also, all of these pieces are 22 thread, warp thread to an inch, and lay, lace weight yarn. Uh, this is pomegranate as well, and sapote, which is natural sheep color. Here you obviously, the, the, um, this movement of grecas, for those of you that might have already been to Oaxaca, uh, the designs that you see on the walls of Mitla has been such a prominent, prominent in my work because of my findings here in the United States with uh, California modernism, specifically my findings in the architectural uh, art practice. This is a close up how this piece looks. I started to really free myself uh, more so over the timing and be able to start incorporating uh, not so much of just movements, but texture within the work. This is another piece that yet could show the sub, such simplicity and the minimalism and could show the, these um, movements and specifically um, the, the, the connection with architect, architectural, but also um, this particular design was actually add on after the piece was woven. So this is a completely embroidered work. The piece was woven once it came off the loom, then the design was an add on uh, with embroidery. This is another design uh, or another piece that continues to depict these this continuous line. And although throughout a journey and, and speaking of these contexts of movement of people from one area to the other, or in this case, or also like the butterflies, the journey that they take from Canada all the, all the way to Mexico and way back, there's obviously limitation that you could encounter throughout your journey, but it's just how that can continue to overcome and shape in a, such a new way. Um, that is the reference of these lines that you see on my pieces. This is a, a close up how these pieces were not only framed, but also uh, the finest of these pieces. Uh, here you could really see the, the lace weight and the uh, warp thread to an inch. When I think about modernism, abstract art, I really didn't start to realize that when I was growing up because I did not have any other reference until I came to United States, what that really meant. And I discovered this practice by um, specifically to, to the architecture because I, I'm not saying this any uh, 
many other times through my work in construction, I came to uh, encounter uh, the movement of architect and the simplicity and they learn on the modernism, California modernism. But even Joseph Albert mentioned it, that in Mexico and uh, Annie Albert and Joseph Albert spend a lot of time in Mexico, specifically in Oaxaca, um, the abstract and the minimalism in ancient art, or as he says, at curriculum in art, uh, has been there for thousands of years. And we know how much of that influence in his work. When I parallel the two, this is a perfect example to show the simple movement of architect, of the design itself. This is a building that has been here for thousands and thousands of years that was built by my ancestors. And that it is such a reminder of how not only tradition has been evolved and, and in some aspect being preserved, but also how things has continued to come in, in a circle. And that ancestral technique, science and chemistry and art form has always, so much of it has been refer referenced to the contemporary art practice. But this is another perfect example of how these, um, so much of these California modern architect has been influenced by um, ancient Mexico. And that's how this way of approaching uh, work or artesanía uh, started to take shape by the experiences, by the e exposure of different way of being and in such an urban America. Um, also, it is uh, with this body of work, it is an opportunity to uh, re redefine these, uh, these textiles and reinterpretate the traditional textiles. What we call today as rugs, and they were blankets. They were made for us to wear, for women to wear as an enredo to trade by the other nearby community in Oaxaca. When the tourism arrived, they became known as rugs. And they have moved, they, these traditions and way of, um, the, the way the fabrics that weaves uh, the communities uh, has obviously changed over time and over time. And here we can see how this work is redefined into this conversation around the contemporary art world. There has been a couple of times where um, people has asked me um, or have overheard, this is, has happened more in, the tr in a trunk show, not, not an exhibition. Um, someone said, um, pulled her friend onto the side. Her friend was really interested in purchasing a piece. And she said, Let's go somewhere else. I know these, these weavings, uh, it's a lot more cheaper. He's way too expensive. And it just happened to us uh, two weekends ago at my opening in Arizona. My wife uh, heard that this lady pulled her friend to the side and to go buy something that's cheaper. I started to understand, obviously, those kind of situation really early. Um, uh, as ju my journey as an artist for the last uh, 15, 16 years, um, I started to understand those difficulties because we often think about tech, traditional textile cannot be uh, shown in a contemporary art gallery. Um, and especially when you're the first one that's carving out the path, people still question you, you why they're so expensive. I was also in a trunk show this weekend in Los Angeles and I had my functional art and I had a couple of those pieces that are framed that I was just talking about. And someone say, why these are so cheaper and the other one are so expensive. So we always have this relation to, and this understanding that not only that they're Mexican, but they're indigenous art and they should not be worth $10,000 where we don't question that when it comes to a painting. And that's why it is, it was, these are some also the things that has been interesting for me to look into and to be able to 
not only driven by that uh, solely, but to be able to create, the, continue creating these conversation because this kind of work, conceptual work, can only uplift and could merge into other markets that maybe indigenous art has not been able to be shown. This is my first weaving in the series um, uh, that um, continue to engage in the movement, not so much looked into the architectural as continuous line, but this particular one looks into the migration of the butterflies. These specifically, uh, the um, monarch butterflies. But how that parallels with human of my, and migration. I was in Uzbek Uzbekistan a couple of years ago. Uh, so I was visiting a couple of different communities there. And obviously there, that's where it was obviously physically, you could still see the remnants of the Silk Road and how trading took place there and the movement of people and goods. In the Southwest here in the United States, the, the famous Camino Real and what is now no, known as New Mexico, how trading started to happen from Mexico City into what is now known as New Mexico. And not to mention the diaspora of migration all over the world. So those are engagements, those are uh, conversation that has become absolutely evident to me especially now focusing much more my studio here in California and, and sort of a question these things and beyond also questioning is how to find, continue, deepen my understanding of who I am and my role as indigenous of the Americas, but also cannot ignore the diaspora of migration and how that shapes life and identity. The work you see here, it is that uh, uh, basically a piece of textile that was woven with just white yarn. <clears throat> and that um, it was dyed and create movement with indigo. And then later on, it was felted. Obviously, felting, it's not tradition to, to, to Zapotec people. But again, it is this and some sort of a reminder of how tradition is shaped in a, such a new way, but at the same time, it's preserving its identity. So within my studio, the piece was woven and then it was dyed and I collaborated with Casa San Agustin, I don't know how many of you has been, ha, ha, does know what Casa San Agustin is. It is an art center that was founded by um, Francisco Toledo, one of the most um, famous and celebrated artists of Mexico, which passed a few years ago. It was a, uh, a mill, a really old mill, a bandit mill in Oaxaca in San Agustin and he turned into an art center. And within that space, he has a felting studio. So this is uh, that space. So here you could see how this movement is created in the work and how this type of work, it's not anymore defined by artesanía. It's not anymore defined by the cost of rug or blanket. This is a, a completely different way of understanding and approach, approaching this kind of work. The value within it's within the conceptual and the message of the piece. It is not to question of why it's $20,000 or $15,000 because it is the same way as a painter or a conceptual artist and contemporary artist is understanding their process. So the butterflies that you see on this piece are this journey and the diaspora and the movement of human humanity and how it's continued to shape in a different form. Later on, once we start doing the, um, the studio tour, I am going to show you how we use this design in a, in a uh, traditional aspect. So this is what we call 
a, a butterfly. So functional work, what is functional work? The best, the best um, example that I could share with you guys, and, and I'm sorry, I don't actually don't have an image, but Joseph Alberts, as many of you, you know, uh, know, know his work, he did an incredible drawing and a painting in fact, and it's framed just like any other painting. But then the same design he printed on a, on a shirt. That obviously does not need to be explained what is functional art, what is the art form. But in my practice, I wanted to really start to talk about this so that way we can start to understand the two aspects of the work that I have been creating. The work that you see here on your screen, although the, the approach and the process, it is also a concept, uh, con a, a contemporary uh, process, contemporary art practice process, more conceptual, um, but it's still functional because it is still being used as well. It is made with plant fiber, with uh, indigo dyed, but it looks into how a petate, a palm leaf mat that has been used, which has been used for thousands of years, it is a cultural object for everyday uses for ceremonies. I was really drawn by the movement of palm leaves, how it, it creates this movement when it's woven. But it can still be seen as, an, as a rug. The continuous line and this movement and the, the felting piece that I just showed, um, those cannot be used on the floor anymore. Those cannot be used as a rug nor blanket anymore. But these pieces still, it, it can still be functional. And even though the approach is conceptual and two of these pieces are actually in the collection of the this, Smithsonian, this, this is one of them, the red one here. Okay. And uh, my most recent work when it comes to the traditional um, technique um, or more of a uh, abstract of expressing the sarape specifically are these sample. This is also a 23 warp thread to an inch lace weight um, and can only be used as a uh, wall hanging, although the approach might not be in a conceptual process. Now, this is for those of you that has probably been following my work, has a little bit more reference to my work. Now this could be used as rug, but also the static can still be uh, very well cared, very well maintained. This is another way to use the butterfly design. This is all natural sheep color and it's undyed. I really like to use the raw material and the natural sheep color because of the movement and the depth that the, nat that, that, that the colors create. It definitely, uh, we don't have gray sheep, at least in Oaxaca. So the gray is created by carding white wool and black wool. And because there's no sheep alike, they will naturally create this variation. This is another piece that continues to engage in these traditional elements, but here it's extremely simple, but it's also functional. This is another piece that, yeah, maybe because of the shape could be, could be seen as a wall hanging, but also it's, it's a rug. And it was really uh, interesting to, to be able to seam them together or create this uh, aesthetic as they're seamed together, but they're not actually seamed together. And there's just, um, to, I was really inspired on seeing really old textiles in, uh, in our community, maybe in, that still was made in the seventies that the loom was really narrow. So in order to make a matrimonial size or a queen size, they'll seam them together to make one big size. So this piece here right on the center, it's not seamed, but I, I, this piece was woven to, uh, to show that static. This is another piece that is just create this movement, that it's subtlety, but just natural sheep color, and that naturally will create this movement. This is all hand spun using traditional drop spindle. This is another design that you saw on the walls of Mitla, and I'll show in a little bit how it has been used traditionally. And much, much of my design, it's some, so simplifying these traditional techniques. 
And, and lastly, um, these are some of my um, bags that I have been working for a while. As you can see, this is a perfect, there's no any other perfect example to show my, my functional work. So these are bags that has been um, um, obviously uh, woven, but then um, finished here with beautiful leather, genuine leather work, uh, really well maintained and cared for all the uh, details of it. This, here's another one. On my website, once you see uh, the pictures are not really, uh, they didn't, um, it looks like the website didn't, how they're setting within the, the shop online, some of these photos could be cropped. I noticed that last night. That's why I, I decided to add a few here so you can see exactly how they look. These are the details of the quality of, of the sewing and the details. This is what it looks like inside. And, and you know, looking at this picture, this is my wife and my little one, Noah. Uh, this is at my studio here. It really start to, um, this studio space has obviously enabled me to think so much about um, what preservation means and, and how the diaspora migration, um, how the younger generation are very vulnerable when it comes to tradition. But also, it also reminds us that these particular uh, our practices involve so many involve so many people. I continue to maintain my first studio in Oaxaca. There are only thirteen of us in the in the studio there now. Uh, and here, my my kids and wife are also involved. So in many cases, my art practice is a um, social enterprise that continue to support and, and encourage, obviously. Indigo uh, farmers, cochineal farmers, uh, the spinners, and so forth. So when I think about the reason of my existence, is obviously to be able to bring the knowledge and wisdom into my work, and and the need of expressing as an artist, but also the need of invest investing in culture, in innovation, in preservation, in need of invest in the future of humanity and healing of Earth and nature. Uh, we often, and especially here in the United States, we use so much of the word of supporting small businesses, supporting this, which is absolutely amazing to, for us as culture here to be thinking about how we can better help um, projects. To me, is how we can better invest in the future of using natural dyes, of, of encouraging uh, innovation, and that's some of the things that I have been really thinking about. And engaging, I've uh, been engaging quite a bit through my Getty project, uh, young weavers, I'm sorry, young um, indigenous people here in uh, the county that I live in, who has not been able to obviously even return, many even return to Oaxaca and visit their family and reconnect with cultural identity, but has been some great conversation that has kept come up through our visits here in, in, in in the studio and um, speaking about how this tradition could, could be evolved, preserved. And with that, I would love to um, get out of, uh, I'm gonna stop the sharing here for a second. If I could get to it. Should be up at the top. Yeah, I can't even see my... Uh, I think I, I can stop it. Yeah, if you can stop it, sure. would be great. Mm -hmm. appreciate that. There you go. Okay. So um, I would love to um, go ahead and switch it to uh, the camera and um, to my phone so that way I could do a little uh, a studio tour. So you guys will have a... Uh, So we'd love, to, we'd love to do this in a casual. We'd love to hear from you as well, ask questions. I'm just imagining this, um, celebrating. We are, we are all here in the studio. And just to be able to you know, share with you guys, ask questions. Some of these pieces might not be on a line store. 
take a screenshot, send it to me. For those of you that are um, maybe uh, out of the country, please, if you're interested in some of the pieces, send me an email so I could quote a quarterly uh, the shipping cost. And um, if you're nearby, come and visit one of these days, maybe <laughs> the studio. But um, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and we're looking at this camera now. So, so welcome, Fizi New Pet, you to find the views to one last thing. Thank you for coming and join me here at home. So we are at my studio here in Ventura. And uh, so this is uh, uh, when you when you see uh, this part here. So I think of it as my my dining area. So what you see behind me here, it is where I'm farming my cochineal insect, all the insects that you see on these leaves of, of, of cactus, that's one insect. What you see there, that's one insect. And in other lectures, and talk quite a bit about how those insects being processed, and I can safely say this is the indigenous seed of my ancestors. It takes about 60 to 70,000 insects to make one pound of thigh stuff. So what you see here, it is very small um, production and farming with the idea of soon to have a piece of land that I could actually grow more of my diet plants, medicine plant, food, and of course, cochineal insect here in Ventura. So these are my traditional tools. These are the same tools that my ancestor has been using for obviously thousands and thousands of years. And this is what the cochineal looks like when they are already uh, grind up. Uh, I'm sorry, when they are already dry. I know in the video, I was showing a little bit about how, how that it's being grind. So I just use the same process. And it, would they be a better and easier way to do these things? These processes. Okay, try now. Okay, wonderful. Hey, please let me know. If, please let me know if I'm going too fast. Um, so um, yeah, this is uh, my uh, my metate. I have one one for indigo and one for I'm um, sorry, one for cochineal insect and one for indigo. These are my indigo indigo ferra superpicosa, native to the Americas. It grows on the more tropical areas of the Americas. It's also known as mine blue, and in Oaxaca it grows. Um, now predominantly in Iltepec, it's one of the communities there. And um, this I purchased it at this stage and then from here, obviously, many of you know, then what are the processes to actually obtain the indigo? But so it has to be obviously grind up first because it comes at this stage and then from there, the other process starts. And, and uh, what you see here on this area, it's obviously a couple of different plants that I use, but also um, the yarn you see here. This is a, a very simple understanding and, and to show uh, how the shifting of the pH start to shift the colors. But also so many of these colors that you see here, it has a yellow base to it. And then it was over dyed with cochineal insect to create this incredibly beautiful red, especially the five, different shades of colors that you see in the traditional or the ceremonial garments, which are these ones here. These are the reds that you get to see on the ceremonial garments. Uh, pericon, it is, uh, this is a, a plant that's used for yellow, but also for medicine. And it is something that you could also find with, with Kathy. Uh, Flor de Sempasuchil, uh, uh, or um, marigold. A pomegranate that you see here that is actually, it was, uh, I, 
deeply appreciate Kathy for donating uh, pomegranate when I first, and, and, and by the way, this studio has only been officially existed just beginning of the year. And has always, I was always working at my studio in Oaxaca, but with the pandemic, I could have gone back and, and start working, you know, at the studio, but also, you know, has this studio has served into, for my kids to be able to reconnect and for the indigenous youth I was talking about earlier for them to be able to connect. So this has been extremely a blessing for me. Lujiang. This is Yashi. This is the one that I referred to earlier and how it's used as bathing, as medicine. And of course, um, Nuestri right here, alum and more of my indigo. This also came from uh, botanical color. Thank you so much, Kathy. And of course, the rest of my cochineal insect that you see here. So there's about five kilos there. So my, my much smaller and experimenting either technique, dyeing, and material, I do it here. And then just right outside of this studio, there's a huge and very beautiful patio that I do the rest of my dyeing as, as you saw on the video. Here's where I hang all my, my dye and dry uh, yarn. All right here, so you see a little bit of the, the colors that you see <clears throat> that you see on my pieces are seen. So I had them here, I <clears throat> hang, hang them here. And then from here, then they obviously go to the loom. <clears throat> I normally will have my loom here in this area, but right now is in the Arizona State Museum for contacts there at the exhibition. And I'm trying to actually work on getting another loom in, from Oaxaca to here. This is my spinning wheel here. I don't spin yarn. I actually never learned to spin yarn. My mother's the one that continued me spinning. Uh, but actually my yarn, the, the, my hand spun yarn that I purchased now, it's all being purchased by a nearby community in Oaxaca. Women that continue to dedicate their life into spin yarn by hand and they still use the traditional drop spindle. My spinning wheel is just used to wind skeins, into making this bigger loop so it could be dyed properly and also to wind the bobbins. And how that's actually work is um, so you put your skein in a uh, Over these, this is what we call Bilieni. I know many of you um, has probably worked with one before, and in English, I don't, I can't remember what's the name of it. Yarn Swift or something like that. So all of the yarn has a year, what we call year, years which is the, the loop, this loop here. They all, they all have this. They all have this loop, which separates right in the center of it. So that's the first one that you undo and your skein. This is my spindle. This is the spindle. And the spindle just goes here. So this would be, what would this be? What would this be? Uh, it's called the drive band. Thank you. Drive band. Okay, so this. Now, and for those of you that follow my work, I was collecting carrizo. These are carrizo uh, bobbins yeah. made out of reeds. I was collecting some not too long ago 
I normally share, well, I try to share those, some of the things that I'm doing uh, over my social media, but they're made out of Carrizo and Carrizo is used for so many things, but including the bobbin. There's obviously specific ones that are used. There's obviously a specific way to cut it and so forth, but we grab the Carrizo, we put it on the, uh, on my spindle. And this is some of the uh, chores that kids will, will do. Uh, this is some of the things that I grew up doing. There are some questions in the comments. Sure. Do you want me to take those after or read you some now? If it's related to this, maybe we could, maybe we could to answer. Or maybe I think Amy could probably, I don't know if Amy's doing that. So uh, uh, these are some of the things that a, that a, a child would do. So it coordinates with this. So the one hand, you're spinning here when you're turning this wheel. Another one you're keeping. Um, the yarn wrapping around the bobbin. <laughs> so, um, so that is the function of spinning wheel. Any question, maybe I should pause here before then we do, we go to the next and talk a little bit about the work. Amy, you have yeah. some questions there. There's millions of questions, but I'm gonna to go to at least three people have asked about the wool and where you get your wool. So the majority of the wool that you see here are actually from uh, Oaxaca, Estado de Mexico, that's where they come from. And um, the rest of them, which to give an example of the difference, uh, these, just so you have a, a reference to, um, to the hand spun. So these are hand spun, and this is from a nearby community in Oaxaca. Hand spun, and this is mill spun. Those are the two difference. And that's where, that's where I currently getting my wool. I'm hoping to also find some wool here with um, farmers here nearby in, in Ventura. Um, let me see. Um, a couple of people have asked in kind of different ways, but um, I'm looking at this one question right now from Marie Roncevel. She's saying, can you speak to the vision you might have as you work on a piece that might be used in different ways as a hanging or as a functional piece. And she wanted to thank you too, but yeah, that where you talk about these were meant to be worn, but you have the, the wall hangings, just maybe as you're creating them, like how do you? Um, yeah, uh, that's yeah, a like really that, good question. Yeah, your, your kind of take on that. Yeah, that's really, that's really, thank you for, for asking that question so I can clarify a little bit more. So, so much of these, um, work when they're functional work and what you see here. I don't really think of it as this is gonna be a functional work, this is gonna be a wall hanging uh, because that all being defined way prior, like continuous line or the migration move pieces that I'm working with felting. Those pieces are obviously cannot be, be functional. You, you can't just by looking at them, you can't use them as functional. Other than that, I really focus on, let's say pieces that you see here that could be done in different color and different sizes, different, um, uh, so customize them, right? To the needs mm -hmm. that you might, you might use for the, for the living room. But that's been decided even way before it's gotten to the loom. And the uh, conceptual uh, approach 
to 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 the uh, let's say fine artwork that I'm creating. It starts sometimes years before as a conversation, as understanding of life journey, like the continuous life, right? That's how those pieces starts. That's their process. It's not in actual material and the making of them on the loop. The functional work, even the functional work can still be addressed way before they get in the loom, my focus much more on the aesthetic part of it. On the fine art, it's focused much more on the conceptual part of it. And that again, way before, sometimes years before as a conversation. And then eventually they get to become as, as a fine art piece. So um, I'm, I'm sure they, they have links now so they can look at some of the pieces online. Um, but this is one of the pieces that it's, it's on there. And uh, this particular piece, I wanted to um, share this, although this is a functional piece, but this is my obviously original design. This has again, reinterpreted in the traditional textile. And I show that, and, and also obviously you can see what's here on the wall. Just a reference as the pieces that you see here. All the pieces you see here on, the, on this wall, this part here, are all traditional. And each textiles, design, symbols, and, all, and although with its own involvement, has obviously represents a group of people, a group, a, a community, a region of the world um, that it could very often could, you could identify those people by their dress ways. What you see here and what is now known as rug, you look at these pieces for the people that has a reference to what is a Oaxacan rug. This is what's in mind. This is these are the things that you will see, and these are many designs that are the butterflies, caracol, but um, grecas, and so forth. Has obviously been in source of uh, has obviously been in within um, the the community textile. So many of these pieces I grew up around them, seeing my parents use them, my grandparents and so forth. But this is a very traditional design. And by the way, all the sizes you see here are the same size as the one here on the floor for a little bit more context, and they are fifty nine inches long by 31 inches wide. All these pieces here on this part of the wall, the tradition. So this piece here is what we refer to as caracol or the snail, right, in English. This was inspired on a fragment of rock that was once part of a uh, ceremonial site where our church is now sits in our community. A fragment that has obviously um, was found by, by digging up around the church. This is the last 80, 100 years. And uh, the community find the best way to preserve them is embed them in the walls, the pyramid, pyramid of the church. And that's where you find these pieces if you ever visit our church. So it's one of these designs. It's actually a fragment of it. But the community obviously has been uh, using it in a much more repetitive and makes it incredible. Um, design here. If anybody's interested in something that I'm actually showing, please let me know that I could bring it down and lay it over because some of these pieces again are not on my website. I'm happy to do that, bring it down and open it um, so you can see the entire design. These are oh. sure you have anything, please let me know if I'm going to. Yeah, 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 just there's a Somebody was just asking if you provide a written description of the traditional designs for each piece that you sell. Absolutely. All of my pieces come with a certificate of authenticity that they explain the symbolism, the plants that went into make the color, the thread count, the size, and so forth. 
I'm working hard to raise the, the value of those pieces. So. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, you have such great stories out. about the motifs as, that are part of your that are part of each of your the works that you have there. There's like so many good stories within each one of those um, pieces that are hanging there. I know when you did the feedback Friday last time, you talked a lot more about it, but corn and there were different colors and there was different anyways there was what you'll have to watch the other feedback friday too everybody if you haven't just to learn more to, more about those motifs yeah i definitely each piece comes with the certificate of authenticity that explains that as well so this is uh, the cycle of life design and this is how it's being used traditionally in so much of the designs you also see that they're just bands so each step represents each uh, stages of our lives. From the day we are born, we inquire knowledge and wisdom and, uh, and the interlocking, of course, but this is how it's used. And now this is my interpretation of that same design. This is all hand spun yarn and just the, the steps are cochineal insect. You can just there and go. And, and this is, uh, the same design, but in so many ways has been simplified and, uh, and shows just that uh, element, beautiful element. This is also another one. You can see Indigo, Cochineau, and Marouche on this piece. But yeah, that shows how the text, how tradition has innovating, has been shaped in a, in, in a way that it's relevant to today's environment and how I think it's preparing for the future as well. This is another, another one. This, this particular design, I, I uh, titled it the path, path of water in, re, in relation to um, my mother's practice as a, uh, as a healer that I explained earlier on my lecture, uh, how much of her healing happens in the water, but how the creeks and the rivers bring the force of nature. And that's what the reference to this particular design. It is indigo, indigo, pericón, sapote, and tree moss. Mm. And on each tag also, it tells you all the, uh, the dyes that went into make the piece. You're gonna see that the majority, in fact, all of my original designs, uh, the, um, the ends are tucked back in into the piece. So uh, all the work, it's needled back in into the piece one by one. So that way it does not have any show. It does not have any French showing. Versus the traditional designs that you see here, it, it has the knot on it. And the reason why the, the, the decision of these two, it is just purely as aesthetic choice. To me, the traditional looks much better with a French and the, my original design, because of the simplicity of them, it looks much more elegant of not no, no uh, work showing. And also, I never really liked how the Oaxacan rod has such a long branch because that is not pleasing aesthetically, but also when, if, if these pieces are used on the floor, you could vacuum them regularly and the vacuum will not get cut on the branches. <clears throat> Um, they're thick enough and heavy enough if it's used on the floor so it could lay nicely on the floor. But they're also um, heavy and light enough to be able to, uh, to be um, in a wall, as a wall piece. Yeah. So um, this is uh, a piece that, uh, that it's within the uh, ritual can probably bring that it's part of the uh, ritual series. So this is a uh, plant fiber 
Sapote and Yashi that creates these movements. It's sort of a basket-like weaving because these uh, petates were made out of palm leaves, like a basket through weaving technique, but it, it, it's a mat, it's not a basket. Here you also again see these interlocking of Greca, right? Right here. Just the blue and the indigo on this particular piece. Here you also see um, the other piece that is just natural sheep color. So um, I touched on this a little bit earlier, how it creates movement. I was, I'm really drawn to that because uh, it creates so much depth. And instead of making nature to do what you want it to do in this case, which is obviously when it's just natural sheep color, it would be impossible unless you dye it. But instead, just let it be, let it express and honor uh, the raw material and, and, and the creature that it came from. And use that to an advantage where that is helping me to express also a vision that I have when it comes to the static form. This is the particular design I was talking about earlier on the image. So um, the sewing uh, that sort of looks like a sewing in the center there. Um, and it, that was just an ecstatic also choice, but that um, because I was really drawn by these older textiles, how it creates a movement in the center when you see them together. And that's what this piece is. It is also within the understanding of the path of water that I was talking about earlier. Someone asked if we can see the smaller pieces on the table. So remember the functional art, I think you could see it here. This, <laughs> this could be used as a coaster. <laughs> this is a coaster. And um, another, this is my last one that could be used as placement, that could be used also as a wall or maybe a center on a table, a coffee table, nightstand or something like that. And this is, um, uh, an award that I, that I received about a month ago, Sustainable Luxury of Latin America. Um, Premio a Lujo Sustenible en América Latina. Can you translate that, Kathy? <laughs> so, um, so this was given, um, I was just absolutely blessed to receive this, uh, this, this award. It's given in, um, or the headquarters of this institution is in Argentina, but they basically award artists like myself who is creating work that does not create any waste, that it's uh, quality and uniqueness and that it's innovative. Um, so they see that as a luxury and uh, they award, they, uh, this year's award came to, uh, to us, all of us who makes this possible. Congratulations. Mm. Any other question there? It's just so that way. I don't even know. I, I feel like there's some questions here that I might have to send you that they're um, maybe like a handful that I could put together and send sure, to you later. Sure. But I thought this one was interesting. Um, what was or is the traditional mordant used for these fibers? And do the Zapotec people and communities um, what, uh, did they use alum or what just can you talk about traditional mordanting? You know, one thing it is definitely important to, to, to mention how much was this, how much was lost by the time I was growing up. <clears throat> and, um, and by the time I resumed this art practice, which is 15 or 16 years ago, nothing, not much has changed. So, so much of it has been lost. What was used as traditional? It could be Yawi. Yawi is um, wava tree for more than tea. Now, what I use, the, uh, the, mostly what I use is alum since I resume my art practice. But traditionally, that might have been one of the ways, one of the things, the elements that I was used. And it is also important to say that, and again, this is how this conversation about innovating, preserving, and enrichment of life experiences and so forth. The 200 colors that uh, we have been creating within our studio since the last 15 years, 
That's not traditional colors. Some of them are, but so much has been built on from what was really tradition into the, the extensive vocabulary of color that I use today. Can you repeat the name of the tree, please? Yeah, we. I'll have to type <laughs> it in or something and I could do that at the end. That is actually a Zapotec word that you can find. But these are some of the things that actually uh, that I have been able to do a little bit of research and also what has worked for me as far as using L. For the video, I, I've been putting links um, <laughs> as you're going. I'm trying to find the different um, pieces that you're showing and, and putting the links inside the chat. But for, for those smaller pieces that somebody might be interested in, did you say that they would just get in touch with you and just um, like how, how are they supposed the ones that, you, that are down on that bench, how they're supposed to, to get access yeah, I, to those? Yeah, the majority of the pieces that you see here are actually on the, on the store. Yeah. Or those that are not on the store, just if you're able to get a um, screenshot or you say, hey, you were showing some pieces on the studio, smaller pieces, please send me some images. They own, uh, then I'll know what to send to you. So um, okay. these are six little coasters. That's all I have. <laughs> <laughs> and and one, one of these pieces. And, and so you have an understanding of pricing. Uh, each little coaster are $20 a piece. And these, uh, this is a um, uh, 18 by 14 size and it's 130. That's my last one. They're not on the website, of course. But some of the things that you see on the website are uh, I, are table center pieces for a table or on a narrow wall. This is on, on, on the online. That yeah. seems like an incredible um, hostess gift for the holidays. <laughs> I mean, like over the, again, home Absolutely. shopping. Now. <laughs> it's so beautiful. So these are, I, I think some of the pieces. Nice like we couldn't bear to walk on anything or put food on anything because they are so beautiful. Oh my goodness, look at that. Yeah. And um, how do you wash these pieces? You take them on your backyard and hose it down with garden hose, as we know, with pH neutral by the, you know, even Don, soap Don from the kitchen will work. And you just can't get on the shade and for it to dry. If it's on the wall, you bring it down once in a while, let it breathe, let it get some sun, and then put it back on the wall again. Okay. So these Wonderful. are, if you guys, uh, so this is um, this design here. This is also the reference of path of water, or some other people refer to it as montañas. But this is how it's used traditionally. And this is how I use it on these Inigo pieces. Oh, that's such a beautiful piece. Yes, I love that. Oh. Well, just as a oh. reference, how yeah. um, those designs are used. This is another, this is a traditional piece, but you can see this incredibly beautiful color. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Kathy, do you know you're not muted right now? I sure do. <laughs> you mean like, oh, yeah. Oh, 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 amazing. Oh. Nice. So nice. So nice. I don't know how's our timing, but if there's any other question, anything that I, you guys think I might be missing, please well, let me know. <laughs> Michelle. Yeah. It seems like, yeah, everybody. Oh, nice. Mm. Well, I know that there's a couple people who have been eyeballing some of those. So if you're a fellow eyeballer looking at these, you better yeah, yeah get on it. And, and do you ship to Canada? Somebody just asked. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I, um, Canada, it's not a problem in other parts of the world, of course. Okay, great. Yeah. You'll have to rejoin the meeting. If it's um, in our, I could just do it. Yeah. Here. If it's a um, international shipping, I'm also happy to uh, uh, to go over 
shipping costs or anything like that. Yeah, sounds wonderful. Porfirio, what a treat. What an absolute treat. It was so beautiful. It is interesting. I have seen pictures of your workshop before and I've always thought, oh, his studio is so beautiful. But having the whole thing, the the cochineal, the spinning wheel, the the rugs hanging, the yarn, the dye stuffs, it's the metates, it's uh, fantastic. So thank you. Thank you for that little like trip <laughs> into oh, another world <laughs> is incredible. And I have to say the new work you're doing is super beautiful. Thank it's you. Thank really you. nice. And I hope that you get um, you know good response from these these more kind of architectural clients that you've been working with. I hope that mm -hmm. they're looking at this as uh, really beautiful statement pieces because they are they are uh, exceptional. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kind of wrap it up because we're at 10:30 now. And for those of you who have not bought something off of that website, um, <laughs> you better hurry up because I got a couple things in my bag or, or my shopping cart. Oh, no, um, I was shopping during the my shopping cart. Oh, yeah. Home shopping network. <laughs> Just a couple of quick announcements and then we're going to uh, unmute for everybody to say hi. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about what we're selling. I think that this is um, Porfirio's time. So if you're interested in like dyes, you know what our website is and you can go have a look at that. Um, I just have to say that, you know, today's the last day of um, COP26 and they're working hard to try to come to some agreements. And I think both Amy and I have had some long discussions about really starting to have people answer the call about um, climate activism and environmental um, action. So we're gonna start building that into the things that we talk about more and more. And of course, Porfirio's work is an amazing um, representation of that, that you can see someone who's so um, aware of where things come from and how things are made and then what can happen to them after you're done with them. It's, it's um, very exceptional. Uh, next week, we're welcoming uh, Molly, I think her last name is called Roshkar of Indigo and Oak. Molly's going to be talking about color and wood as she's a restoration expert of historical furnishings and she will in address the way that natural dyes and different finishes uh, become lenses through which we can see and interact with particular materials. So this sounds really interesting, kind of building on what we've been talking about before. Um, we're also going to have a special guest appearance by Stony Creek Colors at the end of Molly's presentation. And uh, they are introducing a new product called Indie Gold. It's a 100% um, non-industrial chemical based um, instant indigo. We were fortunate to get a couple of samples of it and it's pretty interesting. It's, it's amazing. So uh, they're gonna do that and um, demonstrate that for us next week. They're gonna make an actual vat in real time. That's right. And Amy, anything else? Before um, we... I, I, I sampled with that, with that indigo. So I'll be posting some pictures of my, my experience with it, which was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And I'm still playing around with it. Great. Um, no, I, there's right. a, I mean, I have a couple things that I put on there. If you wanted to talk about, oh, you said you don't want to talk about. I'm not going to, I'm I, let's, all right. All let's right. Keep the focus on. Porfirio. Okay. Okay. All right. No, except okay. for thank you for being here. Poor yeah, Felix. thanks everyone. We can go ahead and unmute, say hi to everyone. Yep. And thank bye. You. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank it was you. really thank lovely. You. Thank you. Yeah, muchas gracias, Poe Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for sharing and showing your beautiful work. Thank you for caring so much about That's what you amazing. do. Thank you beautiful. all for supporting my work and for investing in the future of it. Wonderful. All right. Oh, I've got to go shopping. <laughs> yeah, go shopping, guys. Yeah, everybody go those, shopping. Those, 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 like, those, those satchels, those are pretty nice.
Yeah. Someone I had said, one. can you share the uh, link of the shopping? Yep, I did. I shared it a bunch of times. And just so you all know, whenever I put a video up, I always, always put links to the person's website, to their Instagram. So yeah. I'll have I'll have all these links too up and it'll be up by the latest Sunday. But I'm I'm think maybe by the end of the day today I'll have it up. Sounds okay. wonderful. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, anything else, Amy? I appreciate you, Kathy. I Thank just you. want to tell you that for <laughs> Thank the record. You, Amy. I love you yes. too. I love you. <laughs> yeah. are... Thank you all. Thank you, Kathy, for for video is so wonderful life. to see you again. My practice, yeah. Amy, for all your support as well. Okay, and, uh, hermano. This, this cannot be done with not all these yeah, uh, it definitely spirits takes all the, the way community. Around. Definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And all wait right. till everybody hears about that amazing um. Oh the yeah, workshop we're gonna have in Ventura with you in Ooh. April. Ooh. Everybody, start saving. Okay. It's gonna be the experience of a lifetime. It's gonna be so cool. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of everything. Uh, oh, Did somebody already bought that handbag I wanted. Oh, oh no. <laughs> that, there's a yeah, it's six real. of them there. Were... I think how many bags? I think five, but they're only one. I mean, I'm not. Unfortunately, I only I can always make another one, but as of right now, I only have one. Okay. One of I each. guess I'm gonna have to go to Plan B. Yeah, yeah it's real. <laughs> People are really. I'm sure they're in there shopping right now. So if you Good. guys, not to create a frenzy, but get in there if you want to get in there. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank well, you. Yeah. Thank Muchas you, gracias. guys. Muchas gracias, everybody. See you next time. Thank right. you. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.